Welcome back, everybody. It is time for Silver and Black today, an Odyssey original podcast covering the Las Vegas Raiders. We appreciate you being with us. If you don't already subscribe to the show, do us a big favor. Subscribe wherever you get your audio and turn on that auto download for us. We would certainly appreciate that as well. We're ready to talk some Raiders football, and to do that, as always, it's not just my show. No, it's myself. It's Mo Moten. He is the national NFL writer over at Bleach Report. Yeah, you've heard of that small little website. They cover the NFL a little bit. <laughs> little bit. Do some veneer on there for a second. But anyway, Mo is with us. You can follow him on Twitter at M O E M O T O N. That's Mo Moten. I am at LV Gully. The show S N B today. Here we come to you on Tuesday morning, the day after. Wait a minute. The day after. Yes, the day after. <laughs> playing with my stupid buttons. The day after Josh Jacobs and the Raiders cannot come to a deal on a long-term new contract. So Josh Jacobs now has to play under the tag or play at all. We're going to get into that in just a minute. But, Mo, we're starting now. This was the first step to, quote-unquote, the season getting started. We were waiting for this decision. You and I have talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. And not to toot our own horn, but I will – and that is, we've said this is kind of how how it's going to go all along. You've wrote about this several times, too, in your pieces. By the way, Mo, I was also the Raiders columnist up on sportsnot.com. So, Mo, this is not surprising at all. Most people were not surprised. Some fans are surprised because I think they were holding out hope that it could get done. And it sounds like it almost got done to some certain degree, depending uh, where you get your news, but not at all surprising. Yeah. I, I, w- I would say if I were to take a poll of the people that follow me on Twitter, a lot of people are frustrated by the news, but they're not surprised. Mm-hmm. And as you say, they were hoping that a last minute deal would come through. If you read Tom, so- Tom Pellicero's tweet, he said, Josh Jacobs is in the parking lot with Max Crosby, ready to sign a new deal. It just never happened. And that's how close it was. While he was close in proximity to the race facility, <laughs> I question how close they were in numbers. Josh Jacobs did say on Twitter to Kenny King that it was about security, not so much about the uh, the payday, as Adam Schefter said in his report. So what 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 Josh Jacobs probably means by that is he probably wanted more years than the Raiders guaranteed. were offering right. and more guaranteed money because those are the two things that give you security in NFL. Right. Guaranteed right. money. Because we all know players can be cut at any time. So guaranteed money co- coupled with years on a deal. Yeah, and that's where I'm interested. And again, we may never know the truth unless Josh Jacobs or Sark talks about it. I mean, he's, he was lending out hints and talking on social media. Uh, even though he would say no comment to the papers, he was commenting and on social media. Really interesting uh, kind of story with that. But nonetheless, I mean, this is what Vinny Bonsignor wrote in uh, this morning's Las Vegas Review Junior. Our good friend Vinny, who will be on the show very soon. He said, quote, nevertheless, as Monday progressed, the Raiders were willing to go above market trends to secure Jacobs beyond the season. So to your point, reading between the lines of that one is that the Raiders were going to give him cash. They just weren't going to give him years. And so if you if we go on that assumption and again, we're, we're completely going on an assumption here, just making it clear. We're not saying we in, have inside information or we know. But by all the statements we've seen from Jacobs and now from Vinny's story, you have to believe that's what the holdup was. And in that case, again, I'm going to say it, and you can call me a shill for the team, whatever the hell you want. I see the Raiders' perspective. You're not going to give a guy a four- or five-year deal. Now, if they were giving him two years, okay. If they were giving him three years, okay, maybe. But you can't in this day and age, Mo, with the wear and tear that running backs take and with the way the market is, you can't as a team that's rebuilding, because it is, go that far the other thing is if you read Schefter's report even though josh jacobs disputes the part about payday Schefter's report did say that josh mcdaniels is basically prepared to run to have a running back by committee that he's used to having a running back by committee but that jacobs all pro year basically surprised him yes so what that also tells me is that josh josh mcdaniels is probably going to revert back to what he knows and that's using multiple running backs, which you talked about last offseason. So I think a lot of us were surprised that he just ran with Jacobs as the workhorse. From Vic Tafer 
to us, to other uh, Raiders outlets, thought that, yeah, we're going to see three to four running backs touch the football. And I think that's what we're going to see going forward. To Sean yeah. Reed, the athletic, has already said Zamir White is going to be more involved, whether Jacobs is there or not, this upcoming season. So knowing that, that the Raiders are going to revert back to what Josh McDaniels knows, and that's a running back by committee, Josh Jacobs is not going to have the year that he had last year. So if you're going to pay him top dollar and, and for four or five years, it just wouldn't make sense from the Raiders' perspective, knowing that his production is probably not going to match last year's production. Correct. And you have to recall, too, so so a couple things, and I want to say this because you and I have said this all along. I don't fault Josh Jacobs for trying to get everything no, he can, for not. trying to get a 10-year contract and trying to get $100 million. Whatever he not. thinks he's worth, I'm all for it. At the same time, the market is what the market is. And you talked about last year. Yes, 2022, what a great season. He's had a good young career. 340 carries last year. 340 carries. Only Derrick Henry with 349 had more, okay? And so you get it. So so a lot of fans, I think, too, look at it this way. In the convers- based on the conversations I've had with them, especially those that DM me on Twitter, is, hey, look at the year he had last year. He's had such a great first four years. Um, he deserves everything. And, and believe it or not, unlike you and I, Mo, where we, you know, let's say you do a great job writing your NFL stuff, for Bleacher Report, you got a lot of readers and you're saying, okay, now it's time to pay me, right? Which, of course, we all have a petition started for Bleacher Report to give Mo a lot more money. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but in the NFL, you're not necessarily paid on what you did. You're paid on what you can do in the future. Right. And so with Josh Jacobs, unfortunately, this is the way the business runs, okay? And I know there are other positions. I had somebody tweet at me, well, who touches the ball more than running backs? They touch it more than wide receivers, but centers do too. So my point is here that you can't just give a guy based on last year. Yes, you maybe give him a nice bonus. You sign him for a couple of years and you do what you can. But I think that everybody's looking at this the wrong way because we look at it from the, the, the lens of our own lives and how we're rewarded for good work and how you get good stuff going forward. And I understand that. But that's not how the NFL operates as a business. And I understand people saying, well, give it to them anyway. You can't do that because the same people who would be bitching that, hey, they should give him whatever he wants when they lose games this year because they don't have linebackers and they have no money to go get anybody. They're going to be complaining about that and that the salary cap wasn't managed. well. (laughs) Look, Look at it this way, Scott. And this is the one argument that I would have if I'm the Raiders against Mm -hmm. paying Josh Jacobs, Josh Jacobs had an all pro year, won the Russian title, had his best year, had the best year of his career. And the Raiders went six and 11. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying running backs aren't important, but when you, when, how, how much do they factor into the wins and losses? Yes. The Raiders would be a better team with Josh Jacobs on it. No question. But how many, for how many games are they, is a running back moving the needle, even if he wins? Get this, he had the best year of any running back. He had he won the rushing title, right? Won the rushing title, had over 2,000 yards from scrimmage, and the Raiders still only won six games. <laughs> so, what that tells you is that <laughs> you can pay a running back top down, he can have a great season, but if the other parts of your football team aren't operating at an optimal level, you're not going anywhere, you're treading water. And if you're going to pay a premium to a low premium position, it, it's not the greatest of ideas. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Josh Jacobs doesn't deserve a race. He absolutely does. But it would make more sense if the Raiders had won, have been 11 and right. 6 instead of 6 and 11. Now if, they, yeah. they, now, if they went 10 and 7, 11 and 6, I would say, yeah, well, he's part of a team that went to the playoffs, won double, had double digit wins, and he was a big part of that. But even with his best year, they won six football games. Yeah. And right now, I you can argue that how much better is a team this year than it was last year, especially especially on defense. Jimmy Garoppolo is still a question mark. I know I've said Huge. Jimmy Garoppolo may operate a lot better than Derek Carr at the quarterback position, but it won't matter if Jimmy Garoppolo is not available. We have to start Brian Hoyer <laughs> or Aiden O'Connell or Chase Garbers for five or six games. Oh, yeah. So I, to me, if you're the Reds and you're looking at this and you're being honest with where you are right now, that's you're not you're not a playoff team. No. You may you may be and, a 500 team and and a 500 team shouldn't pay running backs top down. That's just the business and, of it. And and that's the point Mo because a lot of people I've seen in the com- just watching the conversation that not necessarily people conversing with me 
say, well, okay, so you won't give Josh Jacobs this money, but you'll give Jimmy Garoppolo this money. So two things with that kind of mentality. Number one is Jimmy Garoppolo was always brought to Las Vegas as a bridge quarterback. Make no mistake about it. He is not the guy going to be your franchise quarterback for the next six or eight years. Okay. Number one. Number two is that's like saying, Hey, well, listen, that guy who fixes my car, I don't care if you drive a Toyota or Mercedes, great mechanic. He's awesome. He is the best there is at fixing cars in my city. That's it's a different job than us. Let's say a doctor. Okay. Doctors get paid different. Their, their value, not saying it's right is, is more than a car mechanic. Cause there's more of them and their position while important it's different, right? So I, 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 maybe that's not the best analogy, but I'm trying to say here that you can't compare what quarterbacks get paid to what running backs get paid. And your point about them being 6-11 and 11 last year, that's where I think it's hard really for fans to understand. And I get it because fans are emotional. They should be. So I'm not going to say don't be emotional as a fan, but as the leader of a team, and I know a lot of you don't like Josh McDaniels. He's got a lot to prove to me as well. But the reality of it is – they were a 6 and 11 team and and while anything can happen they are in the process of remaking a roster so why would you give a running back it might take you two seasons to get to be a playoff team and if that's the case why would you give a running back a 3 year contract or a 4 year contract where by the time he gets to the end of it i made this point on a show before mo he he's going to miss the window and, and I'm all for Josh Jacobs testing the market next year and getting what he deserves. God bless him. But this team is not in that position. And I, I'm just, I'm struggling with finding why people don't seem to follow those breadcrumbs. Right. I, I just, again, I just believe that the Raiders are being honest about where they are right now. Again, had they been, had they, if they had went to the playoffs last year and won 10, 11 games, I think they would have been more eager to strike a deal with Jacobs you know, even even on a long term, because when you say he's a long term piece of, of of a playoff caliber team, but the Raiders are in this transition period. Whether you want to admit it or not, we've said it plenty of times. I've used the R word plenty of times. This is a rebuild, mm -hmm. and rebuilding teams just don't pay low premium position players, right. running backs, linebackers, centers, guards. Those type of teams don't are not going to pay top dollar for for players that typically make less money. Then the quarterback, you bring up Jimmy Garoppolo. I, I saw a lot of arguments. Why why would you pay Chandler Jones? Why would you play Jimmy Garoppolo? What do those two positions have in common? Those <laughs> the players, those positions usually get paid. Even the average yeah. edge rusher, even the average quarterback is going to make more than some of the top running backs, some of the top linebackers, some right. of the top safeties in league. Unfortunately, that's the, that's the way the pay scale works right now. The NFL yep. may have to, if, if the players push – their CBA, they're going to have maybe make some changes there, but those changes aren't going to be made right now. And it, it is what it is. As Saquon Barkley tweeted, it is what it is right now. That is the pay. That is the pay scale for yeah. running backs compared to other positions. I saw a graphic that said that kickers on average are paid more than running backs, which I saw, which I thought was very interesting. Yeah. But you know what? That that's, that's a fallacy because there's how many kickers in the NFL? 32. How many running backs? 160. So when you average them out by the yes, number the average amount. Exactly. It, it, it dilutes it. So, so, right. so people get, and that was tweeted by, uh, what's his name? It was a wide receiver. Um, one of the NFL players tweeted that at first, which was interesting, but anyway, and we're going to talk about that. We're going to continue this subject because it is the, the subject of the day here on silver and black today and amongst Raider nation and the NFL, because the running back position now has become the, the most oppressed position in sports. So everybody has an opinion on it. Everybody in the media, everybody who plays the sport, even other people in other sports are commenting on it. So we're going to talk about that when we come back. And I want to put it into some perspective for you. I'm not anti-running back. I'm just about keeping it real and speaking facts and talking and taking the emotion out of it because emotion is not how you make business decisions, just not. So when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about that. Stay here with Mo and Scott. This is Silver and Black Today in Odyssey Original Podcast. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition, a day after the Raiders and Josh Jacobs can't come to a deal. We're talking about Josh Jacobs, the running back position in the NFL and the future with the Raiders. Hey, if you haven't already subscribed to the show, please do Mo and I a favor. Subscribe wherever you get your audio. If you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead 
and hit subscribe and then hit the notifications bell. By the way, we also have our great mailbag segment coming up on Thursday. And when the season starts, of course, we do a whole show on mailbag because when the Raiders are on the field, you guys have a lot of things to say. So we love doing that. If you want to mail us, just send us whatever you want to talk about, question, comments, insults, uh, uh, praise, whatever it is, you can send it to us at mail at silverandblacktoday.com. That's mail at silverandblacktoday.com. You can also leave comments in the YouTube comments, and we will get to that as well. So, all right, Mo, let's get back into this Josh Jacobs thing. couple things here. You, we talked before the break about all of these NFL running backs uh, and players ta- you know, tweeting and posting about how uh, uh, that it's not right and that players should get what they deserve and all this kind of stuff. Two things. Our good friend Kelly Kreiner, who always has a snide comment for everything that happens in the world, said it. He said, you know, every running back that made that comment in social media has never won a Super Bowl, number one, uh, <laughs> which was interesting. Uh, number two is it seems to me – and I made this comment on Twitter, and I know you're going to laugh. It seems to me that NFL running backs have now taken the place of WNBA players as the most uh, oppressed and and maligned group of professional athletes who make millions of dollars a year uh, this week. Now, it could change next week back to U.S. soccer. It could change to, I don't know, whatever, pickleball players. Who knows what it'll be in the future. But what's interesting about this is, is again, the idea of what markets do and they sent you and that because you have a good year, you're somehow entitled to more money than is the market willing to bear. Just just to do 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 some math here. The base salary that Josh Jacobs will make this year, which is ten point one million or it's ten point oh nine million, whatever it is, but it's ten point one million. Basically, his base salary this year with the tag will be tied for third in the NFL at his position, okay? That's behind Cleveland's Nick Chubb, who makes 10.85. Again, he signed a longer-term deal earlier. And Derrick Henry, who signed a deal and makes 10.5 million. Now, when you include cash with bonuses and all that, uh, he's within $2 million of the league's highest number of 12 million. So the highest paid running back right now in the NFL is Christian McCaffrey, who also was tweeting support for his brothers-in-arms uh, uh, around the pay here. So when you look at this market um, and Saquon Barkley and Josh Jacobs, these guys who want this money, Tony Pollard in Dallas, um, the market is set there. The guys now, I know their deals a year or two old, in some cases, three years old, Mo, but I, I, I just don't understand why people, I mean, people want this team to overspend on Josh Jacobs. And again, Josh Jacobs, great athlete, deserves what he can get, but that's what got the Raiders in trouble over the last two decades. Am I wrong there? You're not wrong, but what I will <laughs> but you're say, wrong. <laughs> no, what I what I will say is the Raiders going back to John Gruden's years. I remember John Gruden gave Kenyon Drake uh, like a two year, eleven million dollar contract. People were like that's a lot for a running back when you have Josh Jacobs there. Yeah, and then you go to this current regime, and a lot of people want to find out well, look. They gave Chandler Jones. Now that's again, that's to me, that's apples to oranges because it's a premium position. But if you look at if you look at what the Reds have done in previous years, they've overspent for premium players and non-premium players. Right, right. And I think what what we're seeing here is correction from the past. Not to say that Josh McDaniels and Daisy are looking at what Gruden did and they're trying to go opposite, but just last year the Raiders were were spenders. They acquired Devontae Adams, signed him to a long-term contract. They signed Chandler Jones to, I believe, a three-year deal, you know, $51 million. So they were in the they were in the market of spending after they went to the playoffs, which goes back to my point in the first segment that you're coming off of a playoff year, so you're going to be more willing to spend because you're thinking, mm-hmm. okay, our playoff window is open. We have a chance to compete in division. And who knows? We get to the playoffs. Anything can happen. Maybe we get to the Super Bowl. But – when you're when you're coming off a six and eleven season, your plans change. The way you see the roster changes, the way you build your roster changes. Then you start thinking long term versus the short term, which goes back to what Josh Jacobs said was this wasn't about money. So I want to make that clear that we're not we're not we're not saying that you know the Raiders didn't come to this deal because a huge money gap because that was that was in the reports leading up Early. to the deadline. Yes, yes. Jacobs yes. tweeted this. Now he said it was about security. And as we said, 
years plus guaranteed money equals security. So if you, if as you said, if you put two and two together, wouldn't say that the Raiders are are pivoting for what they the mistakes that they made because they were just overpaying players. Period. Mm-hmm. Previously, in this case, they're trying to be physically responsible and say, okay, we're six and eleven. Right. We're not going to pay a running. We're not going to give a running back a four or five year deal because we don't see that playoff window or that Super Bowl window open right now. So we're not going to we're not going to give you that security because we may tear this whole thing down next year. The Raiders go three, three and 14 or four and 13. And you have a running back who's got four years on his deal and you're rebuilding a roster with a high paid running back. Timelines just don't match from a Raiders perspective. Yes, 100%. I agree with that. Also, reminder that Josh Jacobs playing under the tag at $10.1 million, his salary this year would be more than 16 teams will pay their entire running back core. Just to put it into perspective, again, that's where the position's at. I'm not criticizing Jacobs there. I'm saying that's just where the market is. So you have to understand that that to your point, Mo, about where this, this lineup is, where this, this, this front office is. And I, I would the only thing I'd push back on you on on your statement there is I think they are sort of doing a little bit of the opposite of what Gruden did, meaning that they're not going to go overspend uh, on players that that aren't in those key positions, right? So so you look at it that way and you think to yourself, yeah, Chandler Jones, that's the one that comes up. But at the time, just like they signed Waller and they signed Carr, they felt walking in the door because they hadn't been around this team that they were closer than they were. They admitted this after the season. So they spent the money on Chandler Jones because they felt like, wow, to your and it makes your point perfectly. They felt like they were close to being a playoff team because they were the year before. So, okay, let's do this. And it didn't work out. And they realized they weren't. So doing that, you have to do it prudent. You have to be prudent with it. And, and emotional decisions as a business never work out. I had some people, some people I respect greatly who own their own businesses telling me, no, this is a time when they should be emotional. It's not how it works not how it works you have to be able to stick to the plan and i understand a lot of you are skeptical of the plan and you should be skeptical of zeke or fine skeptical for sure of josh mcdaniels that's totally fine but they are following this path and if you're a raiders fan you might not like the path they're on but it's the path they're going to go down the owner's on board no he's not going to sell a team no you can't petition him to fire the coach petitions don't work they don't listen to you so we'll have to see what the result here is. But certainly this whole Josh Jacobs situation, Mo, we talked about it before, is to me more about now how it's managed in the locker room. What impact will it have in the locker room? Because Josh Jacobs shouldn't play in the preseason anyway. To have him not on the field is not in any means to me a loss because now the Raiders get to see Zamir White and a lot of the Bertain Brown, all these guys that they have and see what they got. Yeah, just to spin this forward, to spin this whole conversation for not dwelling on what happened on Monday, this is a big opportunity. I'll tell you this. This is a big opportunity for Zamir White, Britton Brown, Sincere McCormick, Austin Walter. Now, running backs emerge at, you know, middle rounders, undraft guys emerge all the time. Let's see, we'll see if one of those guys emerge. But if I'm throwing out a prediction since since we were, I, I don't again, I don't want to toot our horn since we were right about this one, about Josh Jacobs not getting a deal. I, I firmly believe that Josh Jacobs is going to report back to the team late August, early September, like mm-hmm. a week or two before week one, simply because if running backs in their prime are not getting paid while active, it doesn't really help a running back in his prime to sit out a whole entire year. To me, right. it, it just it it doesn't make any sense. If, if you're not going to get paid after winning the Russian title, what makes you think you're going to get paid? Sitting one out. year inactive sitting out inching closer to 30 right. years old because regardless of what the wear and tear is on your body as a running back teams start to look at running back sideways once they start to approach 30. yeah so wasting a year in your prime is not going to help you and this is why i believe josh jacobs is going to return maybe he has other plans i don't know what josh jacobs is going to do he may he'll hear this and say mo you're full of it i'm not coming back but i firmly believe that the way it's set up for running backs He's not at this point. He can't get a new contract until 2024 offseason because that deadline is passed. He either plays, he either sits out, doesn't get paid, or plays on the franchise tag. And I think you take the money which you can get versus not getting paid at all. There's there's no benefit at all, zero benefit 
from him not playing. And like I said, I don't blame him. And I, if I was him, I would not go to training camp either. Number one, he doesn't need it. If he gets in shape, like you said, comes in a week or two before, I wouldn't touch the field if I got to camp either. I would just be working out and getting in shape that way, learning any playbook changes, that kind of stuff. Outside of that, I'm not getting on the field. He should not get on the field. I'm glad he's not going to. To, to not only get the opportunity to see the other running backs, but also to preserve his health. But he been in the last few days, you saw Le'Veon Bell. What did he come out and say? That he mistake. made a mistake in Pittsburgh that, that year he held out doing the same thing. So it, be, it benefits them. And actually, it benefits the Raiders if, if Josh Jacobs, believe it or not, if he were not to play, because guess what? In the NFL, if you guys don't know, players get paid by game. Okay, they have a contract, but all that money when you see their contract is paid over 17 weeks. So when they go to camp, they're not making any money. They don't get paid any money. Now, there might be a bonus, a camp bonus, that type of stuff. But as far as their main salary, they get it by game. So he doesn't lose any money not going to camp. But as soon as games begin, as soon as week one starts, if he's not there, boom, that's that's the money right there. And so if you're going to give up $10 million, I just don't see him. He's a smart young man. He's come from amazing, amazing challenges in his life with his father. We've read all the stories. I don't think, I mean, he's not that kind of guy. I really think he'll be there for the season. And then I think he'll be playing elsewhere next year. And God bless him. I hope he gets the deal he wants. And I think this is the reality of the situation, Mo, and people need to get used to it. There are other running backs who are out there. And some might say, well, he run the rushing title last year. He was an all, yes. But Austin Eckler, look at him. If you look at his numbers over, over his career, what he's been able to do, including the receiving numbers, he has a great um, opportunity, or I should say, a great argument for making a lot more than he's making. So it's not just like it's Josh Jacobs. Obviously, it's a running back situation. Uh, but this team overall, where it's at, as great as Josh Jacobs is, and as much as everybody out there loves him, you have to be willing to look at it through that lens, uh, as we've been doing uh, the whole time. Uh, but for fans, I know it's hard because they love the guy. I think we. this is the whole... This is the perfect time to say two things could be true. Mm. The Raiders did the prudent right thing physically yep. with how they handled this position. And yes, Josh Jacobs deserves a pay raise. Both things can be true. Correct. The The issue is that the Raiders had, had the leverage in not having to pay him and saying, okay, we'll see. It, you either play, for, play on the franchise tag or you sit out a year and you start missing game checks which I don't think is going to happen. No. Josh Jacobs' part of the leverage is, I don't have to report to camp. You can't find me because I haven't signed my franchise tag, uh, my franchise tender. So Jacobs is not subject to fines because he's not under contract. And as you said, he could just pop up a week before week one and say, okay, I'm ready to play football. He wouldn't, he wouldn't be, he would skip the fines. He'd be able to skip training camp, working out in the hot sun. <laughs> As a veteran, veterans, as we know, veterans all the time do this. They skip camp. They're veterans right now in the free agent market who are waiting to sign until training camp starts because they they wanted they wanted to skip OTAs and mandatory mini camp. There are veterans who are going to wait to sign until August twenty something because they want to skip the dog days of summer. Yeah. That's not a secret that veterans don't love training camp. You know, if you're five, six, seven years into your career, even four years into your career, you you typically want to skip the summer. So. Both sides, in a sense, I don't want to say could win, but both sides could have their way where Jacob says, okay, fine, I'll play, but I'm taking the summer off. And the Raiders say, yeah. okay, we'll have, we, we get Jacobs back on the field, but we're not going to give you that long-term, long-term security that you wanted. Now, it boils down to, and you kind of said it at the end, when, it's, when the dust settles, I don't think Jacobs is going to be a Raider for the long term because there's some people who ask me on Twitter, do you think Jacobs is going to be a Raider for, for his entire career? And I would say no. The way things are shaping up, Zamir White's going to be more involved. Jacobs is probably going to want to get paid next year, definitely, because he didn't get it this year. Mm -hmm. And the Raiders are probably not going to give it to him. So assuming Jacobs comes back, enjoy this year of Josh Jacobs in a Raider uniform, because I don't think it's going to go beyond 2023. I agree. And and the last thing, I'll close this segment before we move on from, from the Josh Jacobs situation, although it's it's kind of, uh, it's tentacles reach uh, into other areas of the of the team as well, which we'll talk about in the third segment is this idea a lot of people talking about, well, and you even mentioned it earlier, Mo, that, well, maybe they can, the NFL Players Association, when they negotiate CBA, well, the CBA is in place for eight years, okay? They just did it last year, two years ago. So you got six years left. So nothing's going to change in the meantime. And I also want to just say, too, that 
I don't think the rest of the NFL, you have to remember how many players in the NFL, okay? And how many of them are running backs versus not. And would you cut a new deal and throw away the deal you have to benefit a small percentage of your group? That's the answer. And, and, and I don't think there's any way that happens. I don't think it happens. I think the market is, it changes. Look, linebackers, remember when linebackers, special middle linebackers used to get all that money? Do they get that money anymore? No, very few, okay? So it goes, it ebbs, and it flows. So the market can change over time, and I see that happening. But I don't see is them changing that because it's sort of like, and, and I'll bring up, God forbid, the third rail politics. It's like a Republican wins the, uh -huh. the, the, the electoral college for president but loses the popular vote. So all the Democrats want to change that and go to popular vote. When a Democrat wins the electoral votes but loses the popular vote, the same thing happens, right? All of a sudden, you want to change the game, okay? And in this case, I understand people saying, well, they're not getting what they deserve. Well, no, they are getting what they deserve. So I invite you to read an economics book. That's all. Because, no, it's true, though. It's true. Read economics, supply, demand. I mean, Mo, you were tweeting supply and demand, weren't you not? I mean, it was... That's what it is. And I'm not saying those guys don't deserve every cent because they put their bodies on the line. It's in that position, especially. But the NFL is where it's at. If you don't like it, then I understand. And you could say, hey, I'm not watching the NFL anymore because I don't like the way they treat their players. That's totally fine. That's a valid point of view. But in today's market, that's what it's going to be. And so you got to get used to it, at least for the time being, until it changes in some point in the future. Here's the thing. I saw a lot of people yesterday saying, Forget the market. You have to keep good to great players. And I, I understand that perspective. You do. I, 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 I strongly believe in keep your best players. But you just can't ignore what the market dictates. No. And, 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 the, Raiders certainly, and the Raiders certainly are not ignoring the, what the market dictates. Because if you look at the way Dave Ziegler and D Josh McDaniels have built the roster, everything they've – not everything, but what they've done this offseason is shown that they are looking at the pay scale – of these position players. Look at some of the positions they haven't invested a lot of money in. We talked about the linebacker position for weeks and weeks and weeks. It's a low premium position. They're not paying a lot to their running back room. The safety position is at the bottom of the premium scale positions. Look at what they did to the safety position. Haven't brought back Deron Harmon. Mm -hmm. They may have a rookie in Chris Smith the second, who I think is going to be pretty good starting. They didn't spend a lot of mar money on Marcus Epps. Look at the guard position. Not a lot of money invested in that position. It's a low premium position. They have a rookie and Dylan Parham there, and they may have Alex Bars. They did sign Greg Van Roan, but they aren't paying those any of those guys a lot of money. So yeah. just look at it. Guard, safety, running back, linebacker. Those are probably four of the lowest premium positions on the pay scale, and the Raiders are not investing much money in those positions. It tells you everything you need to know about how they are building this roster. And again, I, I, you know me, I like to use analogies. It's sort of like if I own a little, I own a grocery store. Let's say I'm in New York where you are, Mo, and I own a little bodega, okay? And I got entry-level stock person, and I have the manager who manages the place for me because I'm, I'm an owner, and I'm only there a couple days a week, so I have somebody running it for me. Now, the stock boy or girl is there and is an amazing employee, great, does, shows up on time, does a great job, keeps the store all in shape. They come to you and say, hey, listen, Am I doing a great job? Yeah, you're doing a great job. You're fantastic. Okay, you're you're a year into your your career, your job, and now listen, I got a job offer to go over to the big uh, market down in Soho. It's a, it's a kind of a little swanky place. They're going to offer me, you know, uh, thirty dollars an hour. Can you pay me thirty dollars? Well, no, I can only pour for the eighteen I'm paying you or whatever the number is. Would you would you give that? Would you overpay that person? They do a great job. They're the best person at what they do, or at, the, at and you might lose your manager who runs the place for you. You can't do that. That's what I'm talking about with the economics is there are good people who come through and they deserve whatever they get. So the stock person, hey, thank you so much for what you did for us. Good luck in your career. You're always welcome to come back if you need to. Boom. Thank you. People and, and players and businesses have employees that come through all the time. It's not that you don't appreciate them. It's not that they don't deserve what they're worth. But certainly under the conditions, you have to pay what you can pay and the Raiders are in the position where they're rebuilding and they have a lot of a lot of question marks, which we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks. This camp begins. So um, there you go. All right, Mo, we're going to switch gears and we're going to take our final break. When we come back, we're going to get into the rest of the question marks around the Raiders. And what might this Josh? We'll talk a little bit more about the locker room issue because a lot of people are going to that. Mo, you've talked about it over the past several weeks. 
I think it is an issue. I don't yep. think as big of an issue as maybe some people make it to be. So we'll talk about that when we come back here. You're listening to Silver and Black today, an Odyssey Original Podcast covering your Las Vegas Raiders. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. It's time for the home stretch here on Silver and Black today, the Tuesday edition. Mo Moten, he's national NFL writer over at Bleacher Report, also the Raiders columnist at sportsnot.com. You can follow him, converse with him, tease him on his food takes at Mo Moten, M O E M O T O N, on Twitter. I am at LV Gully on Twitter, Scott Branson, your co host. And you can also follow the show at SNB today. We are also, myself and the show are now so also on threads. Mo's not there yet. He's a one channel guy. Right, Mo? It, just a side note about threads. A lot of people have asked me, are you going to be on threads? Are you going to be on threads? <laughs> I, I just feel like threads was, um, you know, one of those emotional. It took advantage of a lot of people's emotions. People were, uh, are I upset. Agree. were upset with Elon Musk and the rate limit that he put yeah. on Twitter. So a lot of people were like, oh, screw this. I'm going to go to another platform. But trust me, by the time the NFL season rolls around, a lot of those people may still have their thread accounts. But they're going to yeah. flock back to Twitter because Twitter right now is is is, pro, is one of the primary. It's it's the social media platform. And now that yeah. Elon has rolled out payments for creators on the platform, yeah, you know, people are not only going to flock back to Twitter, but they're going to get that blue check, and they're going to try to capitalize on it. I'm one of those people. I'm going to have disclaimer. I'm going to have a blue check soon. It's going to happen soon. You know, because yeah. I, I, you know, people grift off my tweets all the time. So why not? <laughs> Why not? Why not make money off off these tweets? I, I'm not yeah. above making that extra dollar if I can. And a lot of people yeah. are going to hear this and say, "Oh, Mo's a hustler." I'm from New York City. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> I'm from an area where all we do is hustle. So I, I have no problems paying. What is it? Eight dollars a month $8. for a blue check. I know yeah. people have pointed the finger and laughed at people for doing that, but if you're making extra dollars, I, I don't see the problem in doing that because I don't fault anyone for making money how they can. Well, and it's a it's it's a feature set. By the way, Mo will be out on the street here in a couple hours doing three cards. So make sure you check him out. Um, <laughs> for those of you who've been not been to New York or understand New York, you might not get the joke. But anyway, yeah. um, we we look at products, and you have to derive whether or not you see value in it. So those of us who are content creators, the eight dollars for not only to your point about about being able to create content, but the fact that we can also edit things that we can. We get more reports. We understand usage. It depends if you're willing to pay for it. If you don't see the value, then you shouldn't pay $8 a month. What was right. interesting is the clout stuff was when, when Twitter went to the $8, I'll never, because the, the, the legacy checkmark people, which you and I both were, we both had the blue yeah. checkmark that had to be verified before all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But when that went away, a lot of those same people, well, how are you going to know if it's really me and it's all this and it's all you pay the eight dollars, <laughs> and it's like it's really funny with social media. Little 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 soapbox here. Let me let me put on my my megaphone. <laughs> my soapbox. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> it was <laughs> it was it was this, which is we all use this stuff for free because they needed to get users so they could build a database and sell all our data to everybody. So that's why they made it free. So now as these businesses mature and they want to offer feature sets and they run into headwinds and they need like Twitter's obviously having trouble financially, they need revenue. You don't make, you don't make money or you don't survive unless you make money. So they're doing this. And I just found it very disingenuous of a lot of people. Well, I'm never paying for this. And by the way, some of them have, cause I've seen it. I'm not going to rub it in anybody's face. I'm just saying it's happened secondarily is the political view. So Elon Musk by many is viewed to lean a specific, specific direction. People are talking about hate speech on Twitter. Hate speech exists. I don't, you cannot get rid of it. It's never going away. I'm not saying you support it. I'm just saying it happens. By the way, you see hate speech already on threads. Just saying. Not only that, but threads yesterday, Mo, rate limit. <laughs> so, Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it's being used. So, so again, guys, you, you can shift around and do all that stuff. And I'm not saying that you have to stay on Twitter. I'm just saying that, again, the market dictates what people will do and what people will pay and what businesses will do. So, again, it's actually a very good analogy with what we were talking yeah. about the last two segments. Yeah. Um, but, Mo, this whole thing with Josh Jacobs, a lot of folks are talking about, and you've talked about many times, and, and I agree, Josh Jacobs has emerged 
as a fine young leader in this locker room, especially last year as we started to see the transition away from Derek Carr. And um, the Raiders are rebuilding, so having leadership, having the locker room in a good spot, everybody buying in and believing is very important. A lot of folks are making, uh, I think, a, a big deal about the locker room issue. Well, Josh Jacobs, he didn't get his money. But again, I think that that's an emotional response. Could it have impact? It could, and I want to get your take on that. But also, all of these guys know it's a business. And while they might be great friends with Josh Jacobs and believe him and as a leader, I'm sure they know he'll be there for the start of the season. I will believe. I believe he will be. You do. So I don't think it's an issue right now. Now, if something else were to go on and uh, something happens with Josh Jacobs and the team or there's some discord, that's fine. But but I think people forget that NFL players have agents. NFL players understand the business. Josh Jacobs, by the way, for being a young guy, is a very savvy player from a business perspective. Yes, his social media, I think sometimes he's too emotional there, but that's just me. And I, I'm not begrudging him. That's just my observation. Um, but, Mo, it's a business decision. I think players can compartmentalize that unless things get ugly, and I don't think it's at that stage with Josh Jacobs and the Raiders. I tweeted, I said that the Raiders have to be careful how to handle the situation right. with Josh Jacobs because it could get ugly if Josh Jacobs shares more of the details of the contract negotiations. So we all know how it works with teams and player agents, right? They'll get on mm -hmm. social media and they'll tell their side of the story about negotiations to make the other side look bad. So yeah. if Josh Jacobs' agent or his camp decide to go on social media or any platform and say, look, this is what we wanted and the Raiders weren't even willing to give us that. If they make it seem like the Raiders weren't even willing to give them peanuts, then it could rub other players the wrong way. And they say, well, if that's how you treat one of your best players, how are you going to treat us when it's time to negotiate? And I think that's the only way it could really get ugly. Now, if it comes to a point where Josh Jacobs requests a trade, I don't think it get, gets ugly because that's on Josh Jacobs. If he, were, mm -hmm. if he wants out of Las Vegas and they grant him that, you can't get mad because you can say, well, Josh Jacobs is doing what's best for himself. And I don't think that causes waves in the locker room. The only way it causes waves is if, is if this gets ugly publicly, where Correct. both sides go back and forth to say, well, we offered this and you wouldn't take it. And the other side says, well, we wanted that and you wouldn't give us that. That's when it gets a little dicey because, again, he was a leader in that locker room, is well-respected in that locker room. But to your point, players do a good job for the most part of, of – Carpet, car, whatever the word is. <laughs> we all get there, man. Compartmentalize. I, I compartmentalizing everything. So I did, but I did send out a, a, a tweet that said when the Raiders traded Khalil Mack, it affected the locker room because mm -hmm. that kind of came out of nowhere. That was a surprise. Yes. So you can understand why it caused waves in the locker room. After the Raiders lost that game to the Washington, well, the Washington football team, because uh, there was some anthem differences there with some players kneel <laughs> the offensive line yes Derek Carr didn't kneel Jack DeRio didn't kneel kind of didn't support the players there were waves in the locker room simply because they weren't organized but when you can see things happening when things are unfolding in front of your eyes and they're not a surprise it's easier to handle it going into the season and as we as we've said on the show we kind of saw this happening with Josh Jacobs where he was going to yeah. get a new game I'm sure a lot of players felt and he's probably not going to get a new deal based on how running backs are getting paid. So none of this is, is smacking anyone by surprise, which means they should be able to handle a lot better. But again, if it gets ugly in the public and they start going to social media to go back and forth, that's when you can have a problem. And I highly doubt that'll happen for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't think it benefits Josh Jacobs because, again, you the time to reach a contract, a new contract has come and gone, right? Yeah. And so you, you can't change it for now. So what you're basically doing is you're negotiating for next season if you want to stay a Raider, because they could talk over the course of the season about giving him a new deal if he doesn't want to become free agent, which I think he will be. But the other thing there, too, is you, you look at that situation and you say to yourself, OK, um, what what else would Ben who would benefit from that? In actuality, it hurts. It would hurt Josh Jacobs in many ways as much as it would hurt the Raiders. And the Raiders, too, it's not like to, to going back to our earlier point in the first segment. If the Raiders were on the cusp of becoming a great playoff run team and they were doing this to Josh Jacobs, 
then I think it becomes more disruptive in the locker room because then the players say to themselves, wait a minute, we're, we're right there. Dave Ziegler, we're, we're on the cusp of becoming an AFC team like the Bills or the Bengals um, or the Chiefs. And you're not going to pay this guy versus now they all understand where they're at, which is, uh, we got a couple years here. We got to build. They know where they're at. The players know more than we do than anybody knows where that team is at. So I think that's a, it's a nuance, but I do think that that will play into it because there's no sense for them. There's no reason for them to get angry. And let me also offer this. When the rubber hits the road, Mo, people think about their own economic self-interest. So players will support each other publicly. They will say things like, hey, yeah, he deserves to get paid. But at the end of the day, do they want to ruin their relationship with their coach or with their GM over somebody else's squabble? The answer is no. Compartmentalize, compartmentalize, <laughs> compartmentalize. I can say the word. No, but uh, no, but you're you're absolutely right. I you know what I get players, other running backs coming out and saying, you know, I support Josh Jacobs and Saquon Barkley. They should be paid. I, I get the solidarity there, but as you said, behind closed doors, I wonder how many of those players would be willing to you know give up a portion of their salary or go through things where some inconveniences for those players who are trying to get new deals now we'll see what happens with jacobs and barkley i think actually they're both going to eventually report because my my concept is the same for both of them they're not going to benefit sitting out a year in their prime no. now they could sit out training camp and miss training camp and, and preserve themselves as you said but Missing a year in your prime as a running back is, is missing out in a year of pay. And and as I, as I said, as you close inch closer to 30 years old, teams start to look at you sideways. Whether you have little tread on your tires or a lot of tread on your tires, teams are less willing to pay you as you get into your late 20s. So yeah. ultimately, I think those players will report. So we won't have – I don't think we'll have as messy as a situation as people think. People, A lot of Raider fans said it's already messy. And I will say I will say this. It, it, it gets messy if – the Raiders running backs don't look good in preseason or training camp, and they have no idea if Josh Jacobs is going to report. And the market has dried up where you got a bunch of undrafted guys or guys who haven't done much in the past rec in, in recent seasons. Then it gets messy because I made this point on Twitter with Jimmy Garoppolo as your quarterback, an injury prone quarterback who's a low value passer, you need to have a strong run game more so than when you had with Derek Carr. I threw this stat out. Derek Carr has thrown at least 502 passes in all nine of his seasons. Jimmy Garoppolo hasn't thrown more than 476 passes in a season, <laughs> partially because he's been hurt. But he's not a high-volume passer. He's not a no. guy who's going to sling the ball all over the field. So you, your running back, your running game becomes more important. And I think the Raiders are banking on, look, the, Josh Jacobs isn't going to sit out. He, he, you know, look at Le'Veon Bell. He's out here saying it was a mistake. If Josh Jacobs sits out, he'll be making a mistake. And I think the Raiders are banking on, yeah, he'll sit out training camp, and we're, we're okay with that because then we can take a look at Zamir White and some of the other running backs. But he'll be back before week one. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right, you gave me the perfect cue to transition, and that is about Jimmy G. Uh, uh -oh. You posted a stat, I think it was from ESPN or somebody like that, about Jimmy G being 10-2 and two in games where he didn't throw a touchdown pass, right? Uh, which is really yes. interesting. And it's not exciting, clearly. So my question <laughs> for you is a healthy Jimmy G, Jimmy Glass, a healthy Jimmy G, not exciting. And we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, too. But can he win? And the answer is yes, because as much as I would love to see a quarterback who could throw the ball over the field and hit Devontae Adams for 40, 50 yard passes on a regular basis. Very exciting. Jimmy G's not going to be that guy. But can they win with him if he stays healthy with the system? That's the question, Mo. And again, I know everything hinges on health. But assume he's healthy. Could we see this offense actually be better than it was with a guy who could sling the ball more downfield like Carr? Now, pay attention to what you said right there, Scott. And you said it, you said it correctly. You said, can the Raiders win with Jimmy G? Correct. The Not because is of. The answer is yes, and you just said it. My colleague, Brent Sobleski, we call him Sobo, said it perfectly in the midst of my Jimmy G you know, argument that they need a running back is you win with Jimmy G, you don't win because of Jimmy G. Right. In other words, Jimmy G is not carrying you to victories 
with his arm throwing for 300 yards in a game, throwing for 250 yards in a game. Jimmy G is going to manage the offense. He's going to make the right decisions. He's going to limit his turnovers. And he's going to keep the offense steady. Can you win that way? Of course you can. But I think it's a lot easier to win that way when you have your running back who just won the rushing title. And that's why I, <laughs> that's that's my point about why I think the Raiders need Josh Jacobs. Did they make the right physical decision with him? Yes, but they absolutely need him because, one, Jimmy G gets hurt. So if you bake that into the equation that he's going to probably miss five or six games, your running game becomes more important when he's not on the field, when he's not available. When he is on the field and he's managing the football game, you still need your run game to, to be effective to move the football because, again, he's not going to throw for 250, 300 yards. You're not going to see a lot of 250, 300 yard passing games with Jimmy G. Maybe one or two this season, even with the Devontae Adams. That's just not how Jimmy G operates in the pocket. So to answer your question in short, yes, they can with 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 win with Jimmy G, but but that defense is gonna have to step up because mm -hmm. if the defense gives up 30 to 31 points, Jimmy G is gonna have to lead an offense that scores 33 to 34 points. And he hasn't done that a lot in San Francisco. He hasn't had to because San Francisco has had a top-tier defense and they've had an effective run game. Without Josh yeah. Jacobs, your run game is less effective. As you all know, the Raiders have struggled to put together a solid defense. So those are the big question marks. If Jimmy G is going to be your quarterback, he has to have a much stronger supporting cast. And as much as it may sound a little counterintuitive, I think that Josh Jacobs and his agent uh, who advises him see that this offense with Jimmy G and with Josh Jacobs could could be very, very lucrative for him and to keep his value high. Now, you might say, well, last year he had Derek Carr and he ran for all those yards, but the balance that they can have with this offense, with this quarterback, because he is not a gunslinger, might benefit Josh Jacobs. So your value next year and the market could tweak up a little bit. You never know what happens. I don't see it happening significantly, but for Josh Jacobs to put himself in the best situation, I think having a healthy Jimmy G, having that offense – with the double tight end sets, with Devontae Adams, with Hunter Renfro, with Jacoby Myers there, whoever wins out and what we see there um, might be. But at the same time, I'll say this, that we're all waiting to see if Jimmy G gets to camp and how much he plays. Remember, NFL quarterbacks don't really play during the preseason, much like Josh Jacobs is being smart to stay away. Jimmy G knows this offense. He's not going to go out there for a lot either. So I think you shouldn't read too much into it if he doesn't go out and uh, participate uh, all that much with the Raiders, especially early on. Now, later in camp, yes, I think you need to watch that. And, of course, we're going to cover that all here. Uh, so it'll be interesting to happen to see what happens there. But overall, I think that, that, that this storyline with Josh Jacobs, even though the financial side of it makes sense for the Raiders and you understand Josh Jacobs' position, um, the, it will linger over camp because the questions will continue until he shows up and plays in his first game, which would be the week prep, before week number one, at the very least, it's going to be out there, Mo. And that could be a distraction. Uh, the Raiders, knock on wood for them, have been very quiet this year. There hasn't been any off-the-field drama other than contract stuff. So it seems like they're heading into camp coming up this week. Uh, on the best keel they've been in in a while, sands this Jacob situation. Here's one thing I want to watch that we haven't mentioned yet. I want to I want to hear how Josh McDaniels handles this at the podium. What is he going to say mm. about the contract negotiations? Because he's let's be honest, he's in on this. Like him, he and Daisy Lear talk. They know he knows what's going on. So I wonder how he's going to handle what he's going to say at the podium because it matters. As much sure as people say words words don't matter much, it does because the players are listening to are going to be listening to what Josh McDaniels has to say about the contract negotiations with Josh McDaniels, to my earlier point about it can make waves in the locker room. If Josh McDaniels says something that rubs the players in the wrong way this offseason, it could have an effect. Maybe not a huge ripple effect, but players may may start to look at him sideways and say, I, I don't like the way he handled that contract situation. Because let's be honest, the players are eventually going to be up for a contract if they perform well, and they're going to want to get paid and be handled properly in negotiations. So, Josh Martinez has to be mindful of what he does say at the podium. May not have a direct effect to the field, but it has an effect in the locker room about you know, how he handled or how Dave Ziegler in the front office, his front office, his regime handled the situation. Yep, absolutely. It's going to be fascinating, but it's so good, Mo. We're inching closer to, to real stuff. I don't have to see 
you know, best Raider players to ever wear a jock strap lists. I don't have to see, you know, best pizza available at NFL games. Like all those headlines that you've been seeing the last couple of weeks. Whew, I'm glad they'll be gone. We can actually talk about some real stuff. And starting on Thursday, as we close out this edition of Silver and Black today, Thursday, Mo, we're going to talk about some of those camp question marks, right? Heading into camp. What are our big question marks? I'm sure you got a piece or four coming up about that subject um, as well. And, and I'll be writing soon, too. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But um, we'll get into that on Thursday. We'll get into some of the big question marks from camp. We kind of talked about them all off season, but let's identify them specifically. And, of course, we'll watch this news with Josh Jacobs if anything new emerges between now and Thursday. Uh, we'll be on top of it, but uh, we'll also uh, do the Raider Nation mailbag, which we love to do every week as well. Mo, what do you got coming up this week uh, at Bleacher Report and, of course, at Sports Not, which is the focus on the Raiders? So over on Bleacher Report is to be determined. Over on Sports Not, I'm going to take a look at the running backs that are going to have opportunities. Who could rise up and seize the moment? Because a lot of people have asked me if Josh Jacobs isn't back or you know if he misses part of the season. Who could really step up and fill that void? The obvious answer would be Zamir White, but the Raiders have other running backs who they picked up last year, drafted and undrafted, Britton Brown, Sincere McCormick, uh, Austin Welter. Those guys could, you know, ha have some say-so on how much carries certain guys get because, as we said, Josh McDaniels likes to divvy up the carries. So I'll, I'll just go into the story of who those guys are because they're lesser known than Zamir White. The other thing I want to say is really quick, this is not in, in a piece, but I think it's very important to say this, right? And I told a Raider fan this on Twitter. And a lot of people are not going to want to hear this. <laughs> but, with the question, but with the questions that come up, is Josh Jacobs going to report? You know, what's the condition of Jimmy G's foot? What's the condition of Tyree Wilson's foot? Raider fans, you're going to have to invest in a lot of hope this offseason because there are some mm. big question marks between your first-round pick, your quarterback, and a running back who just won the rushing title. All, again significant pieces on the football team even though the Raiders decided not to pay Josh Jacobs and give him that security these are all major question marks and you're hoping that everything falls right for your season to be at least respectable because if two of those things go sideways if two of those things go sideways you're going to get a lot of people complaining before before October hits so we'll see yes there's there's an old leadership um phrase uh and and statement which is hope is not a strategy and Mo is not, <laughs> and Mo is not telling you hope is a strategy for the Raiders. Right. Mo is tell, telling you that hope is a coping mechanism, mm -hmm. and I agree with him. I think that for Raider fans, you can always have high aspirations and hopes, but at the end of the day, if you want to be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. I would be ready for a roller coaster this year. Meaning things could look really good for a while, and then they could come back down and look really bad. I, I would say temper your expectations. A lot of Raider fans good. have have already said this to me that they're either not enthusiastic about this team going to camp or they've already tempered their expectations. I will say, cause there will be people in the chat and I know they're in there right now. Respect to you for tuning <laughs> into our show. There'll be people saying, no, you guys are wrong. They're going 11 and six. They're going 12 okay. and five. They're a yeah. playoff team. You guys got it all wrong. You just got to give Dave Ziegler and Josh McDaniels a chance. And I will say, yes, give them a chance. Give them you two to build. But the way things are shaping up right now with questions around your quarterback, Questions around your first over your first round pick, your top pick in this past draft. Questions around Josh Jacobs. Is he going to show up? Well, I think Josh Jacobs is going to show up. It's not a guarantee that he will. And if he doesn't, that running game isn't going to be as good as it was last year. So That's just right. keep that in mind. And 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 I want to make I want to stress this point, Mo, because it's important, which is we are not purveyors of pessimism here on this show. No, realism. We're realists, okay? Uh, and so we're never going to BS you. We're never going to just spoon feed you, oh, 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 it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And no, we're not going to do that. So I think, remember, too, for us, honestly, as objective as we are, the better the Raiders do, the better for this show. The better for us, because we get to talk about positive things that are great, you're excited. You're you're feeling better. Everybody's feeling better. Advertisers are feeling better, to be frank. When the Raiders are doing well, we haven't had a season where we've really had that. Um, advertisers are more excited. And actually, for us, that's that's great. And for Odyssey, it's great, too. So, again, we never root against the Raiders. We want them to do well. But at the same time, we're not going to we're not going to blow smoke up your backside and tell you it's going to be what it is. 
I, I'll say this. We're not going to sit up here and tell you that the Tooth Fairy is real, and that Santa Claus is real. <laughs> we're, I'm sorry. They, they're, I'm, I'm sorry. The kids are listening. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, hey, kids, if you're listening, Santa Claus definitely delivers once a year. You, if you lost your tooth, Tooth Fairy will stop by <laughs> and give you 20 for that tooth. But for the fans <laughs> listening out there, if you're an um, adult, if you're older than the age of 10, just understand yes. that the Tooth Fairy and Santa Claus isn't, they aren't here to save the Raiders. Maybe no. they're, they'll reward your kids. Kids, yes. if you listen to the car, they will reward you. But Raider fans, yes. they're not here to save your football team. Right. And if you're over 13, you do not put ketchup on your hot dog. I just made stretch. <laughs> so anyway, but yes, I, well said, Mo. It's it's true. And we'll continue that. As we go into camp, we talk about the real question marks on this team. Um, <clears throat> they shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. If you've listened to the show, if you watch and pay attention to other Raider content creators and the reporters who cover the team, you know this to be true. And and so we're going to do that. We're not going to get overexcited about guys that you know are walk-on I should say walk on. I'm thinking college that are undrafted free agents now because a lot of every year there's like one or two people get all excited about and suddenly it becomes they're going to be a freaking all pro. And of course, they get cut two weeks later. But we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about all that coming up. We're going to start delving into camp and what we're going to expect as well as read your mail reminder mail at silver and black today dot com mail at silver and black today dot com. You can also tweet at us. We will include those. We save those questions. So if you want to ask us on Twitter for the show, we'll address it there or in YouTube, leave it in the comments and we will get to your question. Mo, have a great week, man. I will talk to you again on Thursday. Sounds good. See you Thursday. All right. For our producer, Mike Rabier, a part of our Odyssey team, we appreciate all that he does. Uh, and for Momotan, I am Scott Branson. and this has been Silver and Black today. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your audio. Turn on the auto download. We certainly appreciate your support. All I got to say is Raider Nation, hang on for the roller coaster ride. That'll be 2023, and we'll be here with you every step of the way to help you in your joy and to help you in your pain. That's what we're here for. Take care, everybody, and have a great rest of your week. We'll talk to you on Thursday.